already <laughs> half the definitions I'm going to give are there. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, look, this is, uh, it's uh, been 60 years since I first came to the IHES, which is pretty much when the IHES was f founded, or at least the first time. Yeah, the, it, when it, it, it was the first uh, year that it moved to Bure. Uh, the Residence de Lormay just didn't exist, but uh, all the visitors, or m most of the visitors and professors were in Residence Glacien. The um, air was uh, electric. It was, at least for me, it was just um, e uh, extraordinary. There was uh, René Thome um, uh, understanding uh, topological singularities, structural stability, morphogenesis, and uh, uh, Grotendieck um, transforming algebraic geometry and uh, en passage uh, uh, a good deal of the vocabulary of the way in which we uh, deal with mathematics. Um, Grotendieck would very often like to say when he talks about something called it X, uh, he would say, X n'est rien que Y. And by that he would mean there's a change of viewpoint that you have to make and you have to try to understand. And uh, I uh, was trying uh, eagerly to do that and to learn some mathematics. I knew almost no mathematics actually when I came uh, first. Um, uh, and I'm so really grateful that I learned so much and uh, uh, sort of felt the inspiration of uh, the IHES um, from its very beginning. I also want to um, uh, thank uh, Will Hurst for his uh, sort of generous um, and um, uh, just overwhelming uh, uh, spirit in thinking of various ways of, uh, how to put it, of making <coughs> uh, the mathematical community more congenial, or more open, more uh, uh, capable of doing things. Um, he is uh, equally generous in the sciences and the arts and the literature. Uh, of course, uh, I don't, and neither does Gretchen, deserve to have our names uh, as um, uh, named uh, uh, entities in this visiting professorship. I'm sort of speechless and don't know what to say about it, but uh, um, uh, it seems like fun. Anyway, um, uh, the other thing is, uh, this is the fifth lecture uh, today, <laughs> and I can imagine that people are exhausted. Uh, have, we've seen wonderful things. I'm so happy that uh, Sasha Goncharov is the first uh, uh, visiting professor in our named chair, uh, and uh, we learned enormous amounts of things um, uh, in many different directions. So uh, my lecture today will, I'll try to be as un, um, well, as untechnical as possible. And that's pretty easy for my subject because what I'm going to talk about is a project, it's an ongoing project with um, Carl Rubin, which is more experimental mathematics than uh, theoretical mathematics in some sense. Uh, it involves a lot of computation. In fact, um, uh, I will not overload you with computation on a screen, but I do have one <laughs> page, many copies of one page, if anyone wants to take a look at it. At the end of this lecture, there are various distributions you see here, and I'll try to make some sense of what these distributions are and why they are, I, we think they're sort of vastly interesting. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, the other thing I want to say is by making such 
um, a lecture, I want to emphasize that we're doing com computation, that is a machine, ordinateur computation, and neither of us are really professionals. And so if anyone uh, sees something that might be of interest to them and they have uh, essentially any expertise, that have more, they would have more expertise than we would, and we'd, I'd love to uh, chat with them about it. Okay, um, what, do, what do I want to talk about? I want to talk about um, a variety, V will be a variety over K. K is always a number field here, that is say uh, a field of finite degree over Q. And what I'll be interested in is uh, its uh, set of rational points, V of K, the K rational points. But I'm interested in it from a kind of a relative uh, standpoint. That is to say, I want also to be considering always a finite extension field, extension field, L over K. And uh, in some sense, the connection between V of K and V of L. That is to say, do we get, um, uh, I know it's say I didn't like new, <laughs> my mere, mere saying new without uh, introducing extension field, but do we get uh, new rational points over V of L given uh, the extension field? So it's a, uh, this is a relative, um, uh, question, and by the way, some, uh, most of the time, but uh, not always, I'll be interested in when L over K is Galois, so there's lurking in the initial data, there'll be its Galois group. This will be around if L over K is Galois. And I'm going to ask various questions. In fact, it's very interesting to sort of uh, strain, uh, change the quantification. You could fix the variety and ask for uh, all L over Ks with a given G, you could, you could do various things. And um, uh, in certain contexts, you could even be more um, explicit. For example, if uh, V is an abelian variety A, you could, um, you could just, forgetting torsion, you could take Mordell Vey group tensor Q and consider the inclusion in the mordell V group of uh, A over L tensor Q. And um, in the case with the, where the Galois group is, uh, where, the, where the extension uh, is Galois, you have uh, a G representation. G acts on A of L over K. And <coughs> instead of asking, <coughs> Uh, about new rational points, you'd be even, you could be even more specific and choose a representation, say an irreducible representation with a character chi. And you can ask, uh, does chi occur in, uh, in um, this G representation space A of L? For more, uh, to, be, to have a sort of certain amount of uh, uh, easy language about this, I want to make a definition. Oops, ah, I see. <laughs> okay, this, this is going to go up all the way. And this. Hmm, I should have practiced this before the door. <laughs> okay, um, <coughs> uh, here's a definition. We'll say that um, V of a K is um, Diophantine stable stable I'll abbreviate it as DS, for the extension L over K, if 
uh, there are no new rational points. Okay. Now, uh, uh, there are certain varieties that uh, have uh, sort of very clear uh, characteristics regarding this uh, notion Diophantine table. For example, if V is a projective line over K, there are no uh, non-trivial extensions that are Diophantine stable for it. So even if V is a variety that contains not only an image of a, an, a non-constant image of a projective line or a non-constant image of a, an open and a projective line, there are none. One might ask whether that's a, uh, the converse is also true. Uh, so there are all sorts of questions you might ask about this. <coughs> In the case of um, uh, uh, V to be an abelian variety, you, uh, you might ask, does chi occur in A of L over K? And uh, that's the standard conjecture would have it that chi occurs in L, uh, uh, in, sorry, in A of L. Tensor Q in the case where um, chi is an irreducible representation of the Galois group of L over Q. Uh, the standard conjecture uh, would say that that's true if and only if the uh, Hasse L function of A twisted by chi uh, at the uh, natural point S equals 1 is 0. So this is conjecturally that. And uh, after all, um, <coughs> uh, we have, therefore, if you want, we can think of it, this, uh, this question as an arithmetic question up there and an analytic question down here. And it's fun to sort of try to play one of these against the other. So let's take a specific example. Uh, for you know about the L function analytically? What? How much do you know about the L function? Not much. <laughs> Not much. It is equal to 1. Yeah. You, yeah. So this is also the conjecture includes the fact that uh, L of A, A chi at, at S equals 1 is uh, 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 is defined, that is to say, L of A chi S has an analytic continuation, as Ofer uh, points out. Um, and so that's part of the conjecture, if you want. Okay. Of course, you can all, the, in, in terms of the uh, quantification here, uh, you could ask, for example, fix a group G. You could fix the group G to be the symmetric uh, group Sn and, and fix the character to be um, uh, the standard character and ask, for example, does the standard character occur in A of L tensor Q for a fixed abelian variety over a fixed field K for infinitely many fields L? That's already an interesting question. And uh, it's also interesting that we can prove this. One can prove it. It's not that hard. One can prove it where A is an elliptic curve. And we can almost prove it when A is an abelian variety. That is to say, one can prove the uh, uh, analogous sentence, uh, an analogous statement, uh, but at least for N sufficiently large. So there are all sorts of questions that you might uh, phrase from uh, the data of the V over K and L over K and the Galois group. So I'm going to now s talk about V, an elliptic curve, and K cube. When V is an elliptic curve and K is Q, uh, the Chantal David 
and Fernley, Jack Fernley and uh, Hershey Kosolevsky have pretty interesting conjectures about this where G is a cyclic group of order P. Namely, they conjecture, the conjecture is quite simple. <laughs> if P is greater than or equal to 7, for a fixed P, fix it, <laughs> there are only finitely many. Um, L's over Q, cyclic of order P, uh, degree P, that are diophantine unstable, <laughs> that is say that you get uh, actual extension of points when you pass from K to Q. In other words, all but finitely many are diophantine stable the conjecture in this range. And the way they do it is by using a rather, rather beautiful but curious use of random matrix uh, heuristics. Um, and the random matrix heuristics will also give asymptotics. The answer will be is false for P equals 2, 3, and 5. And they, but they give asymptotics for p equals 2, 3, and 5. Um, and I might return to this a bit later. Uh, <laughs> it's false, but with asymptotics. Uh, proves false or conjectural false? Uh, Prove uh, false. Uh, Prove false. <laughs> Proved false for uh, um, the thing is I'm I'm worried about being over Q, uh, uh, but if you allow me to make a slight base change, it would be proved false for 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 any of them two, three, and five. Five is really interesting. It involves a certain curve called Brings curve. I don't know whether anybody's heard about it. We were. Uh, um, does that mean the conjecture will work over another number field or, or not? Um, will the conjecture work over another number field? Yes. With uh, other p's. With, uh, in other words, if you change the number field, you change the, uh, the, the seven. The heuristics is about the L function or about the...? Effectively, the heuristic is both about the L function. A random matrix heuristics is about the L function. and. Uh, I should say also that uh, Ruben and I, Carl Ruben and I, um, have uh, heuristics as well, but we call them naive heuristics. They're dependent only on uh, certain, um, uh, certain distributions having a property that we think they have <laughs> as in uh, the various pieces of data that we've collected. So if you know it, uh, tensoring is Q, that is the stability from, let's say, from the yeah. real function, then is it easy to get back to without tensor is Q? That is the, suppose what? you know that tensor is Q, it doesn't change. And, but you define stable in Oh, oh, oh tensor with Q. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the thing is, if you, have, uh, if you have an elliptic curve over Q, uh, the only difference, that's a good question. I, the answer is yes. But, the, uh, but it's, that's a good question, yeah. Because you can bound the torsion. Exactly. Well, you certainly can bound the torsion, but you can do even better, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so our heuristics, which I'm going to give you uh, in a moment, but before I do that, let me tell you a theorem that we proved a number of years ago. Um, it's uh, sort, of, sort of just published in the American Journal, uh, which got us really interested in trying to understand this whole thing in some serious way. So here's a theorem. 
This is with Ruben. And I know you're supposed to, to put a dash there, right? <laughs> I'm going to do me. <laughs> okay. Um, with Ruben and me, the theorem is uh, well let V be uh, one of two things. It could be a curve. Uh, geometrically irreducible, of genus greater than zero, or it could be an abelian variety, uh, geometrically simple. That geometrically simple actually is important. And V is over a field K. And there'll be a hypothesis on K, which I'll tell you a bit later. It's a mild hypothesis. I don't want to. OK. And so here's the theorem. And the theorem is sort of, is kind of a beloved by mathematical logicians, because there are lots of quantifiers. OK. There exists a set of primes. of positive density, <laughs> positive density, so fix P, <laughs> such that for all integers, n equals 1, 2, 3, and so on, uh, Fix now p to the n. Oh no, forget that fix p. Yeah. But fix that one. Such that for any fixed p to the n, uh, there are infinitely many. What? Fix means for every. Uh, oh, choose you. You choose any p in this set, and choose any n in this set, and then for every n p n, you have that. Yeah, that's what I mean. For every n p n, okay, that's right. I could, yeah. You don't need in logic if you write the quantifier. You don't say no. right, 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 right. Okay, very good, very good. You're, you're, you're right. I just wanted to make sure I was not uh, um, that the infinitely many wasn't confusing. Anyway. There exists infinitely many extensions, <coughs> cyclic Galois extensions, uh, L over K, of uh, degree P to the N. Let us say for fixed P to the N, there are infinitely many Galois extensions. Maybe I should have said that. Uh, uh, L over K that are Diophantine <coughs> stable for V over K. Oh, did I? So I have, uh, some various things I have to say. I have to tell you what the hypothesis on K is, which I'll do in a moment. Uh, a set of positive density, it's what one might call a Chebotarov set. There's some uh, finite extension, and you put conditions on these uh, Ps having to do with uh, Frobenius for things li lying over those Ps, uh, and you get positive density. We expect that this is of density 1. And in fact, we expect even uh, better than that. Uh, infinitely many. This is also rather uh, an impoverished, impoverished infinitely in the sense that if you go up to uh, uh, um, a conductor where you've gotten x Gal cyclic Galois extensions of that degree, it'll be on the level of x over log to some power of x that we actually prove exists. So we don't even get uh, positive density of such cyclic Galois extensions, but we expect um, 
could you say, uh, you said it's Chibotere. Yeah. But if it is then the one, it means complement of a finite set. So yeah, yeah. You, you expect that. Oh, I, I expect uh, I expect complement to a finite set. Exactly. Exactly. The hypothesis on K is simply uh, we want. Uh, I won't write it, but it's, I want the Jacobian of, uh, of C to have uh, its endomorphisms. The endomorphism ring of the Jacobian of C. I want to be um, all defined over K. Let us say the endomorphism ring over k bar of the Jacobian of C is the same as the endomorphism ring of k over k. And with A, it's pretty much the same thing. <coughs> uh, all endomorphisms of A uh, over k bar should be defined over k. So if uh, k doesn't satisfy this uh, hypothesis, you just you have a, a single variety in question. You just raise a uh, uh, pass from k to k to whatever field you need to make every endomorphism um, uh, rational, and you get uh, this theorem. So, um, so, so the next thing I would like to do is go back to the question, the more general question, does chi occur, and uh, is it connected, and, uh, and uh, do it in the manner that's connected to the uh, Hasse-Weyl function, but uh, we're going to do it for A now being not only a billion variety, but an elliptic curve, and K being Q. Okay. Okay. Well, perhaps I could tell you, uh, I was going to end with this, the, con the conjecture that we have, but perhaps I'll tell you the conjecture that we have, which is, uh, in some sense, inspired by the David friendly Kozlevsky conjecture, but is, uh, is um, uh, motivated by what we call our na naive heuristic rather than the random matrix heuristic. We conjecture. That um, uh, if you if we have e over q, <coughs> and if we consider um, b and Galois characters, let us say, or Dirichlet -like characters, if you wish, chi from the Galois group of L over q to uh, c star, and you consider the set X of all such chi's such that, and now, uh, Ofer, I don't need to use the conjecture that the L function uh, uh, extends because it's going to, all such chi's such that L e chi 1 equals 0, but I exclude the chi's that have the order, uh, I, the order of chi, I exclude the ones that are of order greater than or equal to five, uh, and I also want it not to be uh, order eight, ten, and twelve. Uh, and our conjecture is uh, this set X is finite. But try to give you some sense of how we. Um, how we come to it, uh, and um, and for that, I'm going to move to the combinatorial way of thinking of L L functions, namely uh, theta elements. Or maybe maybe one thing I might do is. This is a digression, and if I have time, I might have time. Um, our conjecture that we give uh, is more precise than that because it gives asymptotics for the chi's that are missing there, and those asymptotics compare well with the asymptotics of uh, David <coughs> Fernley and Kiselewski that the uh, 
that they get from random matrix heuristics. Um, but there are lots of, there are kind of wonderful things you can do for the missing primes, for example, p equals 2, 3, and 5. And I, perhaps I should, since I mentioned our, my conjecture, talk about 3. I'll try to do it fast because. Uh, so the question for 3 is, how many cubic cyclic extensions of Q have the property that a given elliptic, you fix your elliptic curve over Q, how many cubic cyclic extensions are there that, uh, where the elliptic curve picks up more points over that cubic cyclic extension, okay? More in the sense of the rank, as you'll see, it's not going to matter because uh, it's going to be governed by a pencil of cubic extensions whose total space is a curve of a genus uh, greater than one, and so we can use Mounting, Mumford, and, um, and uh, uh, Faultings to show that you have a whole pencil of rational points o over the P1, and for each rational point, you get, anyway. Uh, so here's a, here, the, I, I like this example. I'm going to try to do it fast so it's not, uh, it doesn't <laughs> disturb the rest of my talk too much. But uh, the easiest way to try to understand this is you take E cross E cross E, the elliptic curve that you're looking for, uh, cubic cyclic extensions um, for which the, it's not Diophantine stable. The symmetric group of order 3 acts on this, and so you can divide by a uh, 3 cycle. And this is your very generous cubic cyclic extension that you're going to sort of uh, uh, milk. Uh, you can, if you want, sum to 0. Uh, right, you can take the sums, and you can take 0 in here and take the inverse image of 0 in here. So it's the set of uh, cubic things that sum to 0. That would give you a surface rather than a threefold. And you could go all the way. You could divide by the symmetric group of order 3, which gives you sim 3 of E, which also sums to E. And if you take the inverse image of 0 there, you get something that I'll just call P. It's really a projective plane. It's in some sense, the, the, can be viewed as the dual projective plane of the elliptic curve. This is a double cover. And it'll be um, ramified at a, at a curve of degree 6 with nine uh, uh, singular points. It's, kind of, it's the dual curve to the elliptic curve. Uh, and it's a kind of K3 surface wannabe that, is if you, that uh, this X is, uh, if you blow up those nine points, you get 18 projective lines. And so this X is a K3 surface of uh, Picard number 19, uh, 18 plus the, uh, the ample divisor. And um, so every time you find a, a rational curve in this, you just pull it back. So let's suppose I find the rational curve and take the pullback of that rational curve. I get a curve in here, which, uh, well, I'm the pullback, I want the normalization of the pullback. So this is a smooth curve now, which maps to E cross E cross E. And here we are, we have a pencil. This is a cubic cyclic extension. We have a pencil of cubic cyclic uh, 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 candidates, we take every, any rational point there, go up there, and uh, project to, say, the first factor, and you get a cubic cyclic point in E. And as I said before, Money and Mumford and, and Faultings tells you you actually get infinitely many L over K. Uh, the C is of genus greater than 1. That's the, that's the 3. Uh, the 5 is, as I say, even more interesting, but uh, for a lack of time, I'll go on to uh, the analytic story, which is this. But uh, I'm going to restrict it to an elliptic curve and over k equals q. Okay. Now there's a there's a there's a whole. Um, 
uh, sort of essentially mini subject that connects uh, the values Le chi 1 to uh, more combinatorial objects like modular symbols, as was mentioned in uh, Sasha's talk at the uh, beginning of the hour. Um, uh, and uh, uh, lots is known about modular symbols. Uh, in, in particular, lots is known about the, the statistics of the values of modular symbols. But what I want to pass to is not modular symbols, but things that are built out of modular symbols that, uh, that we call theta elements. And they depend upon a field extension, L over Q, a cyclic uh, Galois, of course, if it's cyclic, it's a field extension, say of degree, say, call it degree D. Um, and I'll call it just theta sub L. And the thing about theta sub L is <coughs> it's uh, really more an arithmetic object than an analytic object. It lives in the integral group <coughs> ring of the Galois group of L over Q. So when I write it out, I'll write it as sigma uh, for gamma in that Galois group of uh, some coefficient Cl gamma times the element gamma in the, in the, in the group ring. <coughs> so these guys uh, we'll call theta coefficients. And the virtue of this theta L is that <coughs> if you take any chi from that C L gamma is in what? What? In Z? In Z? Is in Z? Is in Z. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. These theta coefficients are in Z. So they're integers. And if you have any chi from the Galois group of L over Q to C star, the virtue of this theta is the following. Apply chi, you, know, you can apply chi uh, not only to the group, you can apply it to the group ring as a homomorphism to C of algebras. When you apply it to the group ring, you get chi of theta L is equal to something which is visibly non-trivial, non-zero, non-zero, and more elementary. Well, it involves a period and uh, Gauss sum maybe, but um, it's just non-zero times L e chi 1. So if we're interested in is L e chi 1 0 or not, we're really uh, asking is, uh, if I replace this A by E, we will be asking um, is uh, uh, chi of uh, theta L zero or not. And this is, these are equivalent, not by conjecture, but they are equivalent. Hmm. Oh, I don't want that. <laughs> Let me get rid of this. Well, uh, just to give you a sense of what's going on, uh, my, k my L over Q is of any degree D. I'm going to uh, now let's suppose that the degree uh, of L over Q is a prime, although everything I say here with a sort of more uh, uh, um, argument and, and notation um, has sort of um, uh, qualitative analogs for any, any D. Okay, if uh, D is a prime, take a look at that chi of theta L. Chi of theta L is a sum of integers, Cl gamma, 
uh, chi's of gamma, and these guys are p roots of unity. And so this is in z bracket zeta p. So you learn uh, that, hey, uh, we have a certain um, element in, a sick atomic element, if you wish, element in z bracket zeta p. We're asking, is it zero or not? And the answer is zero if and only if all the, all the c's are equal. Ah. So chi of theta l is zero if and only if all of the Cl gammas are equal to Cl gamma primes for all gamma and gamma prime in the Galois group. Okay, so this is the sort of thing that might get you uh, interested in asking statistics about these, uh, these uh, numerical values. I mean, how often are they equal? all of them equal for a given uh, theta element. Let me uh, ooh. Um, So, for example, before you do any statistics, you should try to figure out what regularities these Cl gammas have. So we want to understand for every L over Q, cyclic um, Galois extension of degree p and for the gammas in their Galois group we want to understand these uh, integers Cl gamma and already we're specifically interested in whether you know what happens when they're all equal well there's some regularities before you do uh, any statistics you better take care of the regularities And the first is the sum, we have a, one has a, um, a, a, a very clear uh, expression for the sum of all the Cl gammas. That is to say, in the case where I take M to be the conductor of L, and at least to say what I'm saying without uh, extra terms, um, I'm going to assume that this is square free. and prime to p, if you take the sum of all these Cl gammas, you get the following uh, interesting thing. It's the product for all primes dividing the square free number m of the Lth Fourier coefficient of the, of, of the modular form for the elliptic curve, I'll call that Al, minus 2, times some number, a rational number, and that rational number depends on nothing uh, except for E. Well, in fact, this rational number is a non-trivial multiple of the L function of E uh, over Q at 1, and uh, so therefore this is zero if the L function over Q at e of E at 1 is zero and non-zero if not. In any case, uh, we see that in order to get such, a, uh, uh, such an effect, perhaps I'll put it again on this board, uh, this is going to happen at least in the context where I make the hypothesis of square free prime to P, uh, that Eat every Cl gamma, all of them, have to be equal to 1 over p times, in some sense, well, I'll call it the right-hand side of that equation. What is the, the Al minus 2? What? In the equation, you write product of Al. Al minus 2, where L runs, is, runs through all the primes dividing M. And Al is? Al. Uh, Oh, um, oh, yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, in fact, I want uh, one more requirement with its prime to P and to prime to the conductor of E. 
Uh, and AM is the usual thing. The usual thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, there's a similar formula, it's more complicated in general. Okay, so under these hypotheses, we get not only for, for uh, chi of L to be zero, that is say for L us to get a zero as a... Um, <coughs> a is, is the trace of Fermenius or minus the trace of Fermenius? It's the trace of Fermenius, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, uh, so we get this is equivalent to that. So that does suggest that maybe one should take a look at the distributions related to these values of uh, these theta coefficients. I mean, after all, um, for fields of degree p, in order to get a zero, you have to have every one of these theta coefficients to be equal to this specific number. And uh, so what's, what's, what's going on here? Uh, so the natural thing to do is to produce uh, data. I'll consider it data. And by the way, I'm going to do this data not only for... D oh, I, sh I, I should also s give you one more regularity before I give you this data. Namely, um, uh, the At atkin laner or the functional... Uh, or what I'll call the functional equation, um, identifies essentially uh, one uh, uh, theta coefficient with another in the following way, um, especially I'm still under the hypothesis uh, that M is uh, prime to P uh, conductor of E and square free, in which case the identification is fairly simple. Namely, if I take the Galois group of L over Q, there's an involution, I'll call it I. It's a, an, it's a permutation of order two. It's not a homomorphism, needn't, pre needn't preserve zero, but there's an involution which gives a condition on the values of the CL gammas. That is say, if I apply CL, if I consider CL and apply the involution to gamma, it's equal to pretty much CL gamma up to a sign, and the sign is the root number of the elliptic curve. So if we're trying to make data, which I was about ready to do on this board, uh, I, don't want, I don't necessarily care uh, to take all of the CL gam gammas, I will, but um, I'm, I, I, ha I, I should understand that there is a, uh, there's a, a kind of correspondence between, um, between them in pairs. So here's what I want to do. I want to take uh, all the data. I'll call it data of E and D. And this is just the set of all integers for the moment. I'll normalize them in, uh, to, make the, to make good use of them, where L over Q runs through all cyclic extensions of degree D, and if D is even, uh, if D is even, I want it to be real cyclic. Uh, and I want gamma to range through all elements in G which are not equal to their image under that involu involu involution. These I, we call generic, since the involution has a maximum of two fixed points and sometimes none. And that's my data. But if that, if that were my data and I asked what's the distribution that's de determined by them, it would, be just be, it, it would just flatten out to something horrible. So I have to uh, renormalize it, and this is how I renormalize. CL uh, uh, gamma, I multiply by the square root of D and I divide by the Euler phi function of the conductor of L times log of the conductor, of uh, the square root of log of the conductor. So that's a whole lot of data. <laughs> and uh, the question uh, is, does this converge to a distribution? If it does, 
what sort of distribution does it cur converge to, and how, does it, how might it connect <coughs> with the issue of how often is CL gamma going to be equal to that specific thing. Okay, so here's our conjecture. So, so we begin, you, you're, now, you're now on a computer. For at this point, it's total experiment. Okay. But there is some heuristics why you put those factors. What? There is some reason you put those factors. Oh uh, yeah, if you want to know the CL, I, I will tell you just very rapidly. The CL gammas are really a sum of phi of m modular symbols. The modular symbols are move up in t uh, modular symbols with denominator m. The, the modular symbols move up uh, uh, by log m, by roughly log m, or they're bounded by a uh, constant times log m, m in terms of the denominator. So in order to this bring this to a reasonable range, I have to divide by this. And uh, I divide by this, I multiply by this because I want uh, uniformity for all d. That's okay. So that's, that gives you some rapid reason why I do this normalization. But anyway, here's our con conjecture. This converges. <laughs> so, for the convergence of fixed E and fixed D. Also. I fix E, I fix D. So, the data of ED is this whole set. And you vary L. And I vary L uh, through all uh, real cyclic extensions of degree D. And I vary gamma through all, as I call, generic gal uh, uh, elements of the Galois group of L over Q. And by the way, the other ones I, I, I've avoided, the ones the gamma is equal to I gamma, I, we call special, and they, they produce different distributions. But anyway, I'm going to give you one, and we'll discuss, we can discuss how, they, how that distribution relates to the special ones. Okay, this, meaning that, that converges to a distribution which we call lambda. D of T. And you know what that means. That it means if I, um, if I integrate this thing, if I think of it as a function or a distribution, if I integrate this thing uh, over T in some range, that would give me the, the percentage of uh, elements in this, uh, in this set that live in that range. Do some the measure is this multiplied by dt? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm thinking of it, as you see, uh, yeah, uh, it'll be multiplied by dt. That would be the measure, exactly. Uh, but the distribution has the following properties. One, it's continuous. It's also, uh, we, can, we, we have a sort of clear, clear conjecture of, of its shape, but just continuous is enough except possibly at t equals zero. Two, if d is large enough, it is even continuous there. Simply continuous. Three, the limit as d goes to infinity, which is the uh, over, oh that's the reason for the square root of d there, to deal with uh, this, of these lambda dt's, e dt's, is Gaussian with variance equal to some elementary term. It looks like a bunch of uh, Euler factors times the L function of the symmetric square of the automorphic form, uh, modular form attached to F at the point S equals 2. <laughs> so that's our conjecture. And 
if anybody is interested in wanting to take a, a close look at one, we've done loads of these and I didn't want to overload the, the lecture with uh, uh, a screen after screen of data. But I have an example here of one page, and if anybody's interested, they could take a look at it. Um, uh, I have many copies. Um, uh, we consider the elliptic, the, the only elliptic curve that people start their empirical journeys with, and Sarah can guess which one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There are only two, you see. Either it's 11 or it's 37. I mean, it's one or the other. Well, 11's better. 11's better. We did 11 first. <laughs> yeah. And so we did d equals 3, and there's this. It, the distribution is sort of spiky. It's always spiky. So by the statistical uh, uh, jargon, the jargon of the statisticians, there's kurtosis. That is, it's spikier than Gaussian. Um, and we don't know why. Anyway, uh, it, it's this big for d equals 7. It's this big for d equals 19. It's next. And by the time you get to d of 101, it's so close to that dotted line, which is Gaussian, that it's hard to imagine it's not moving towards Gaussian. Okay, and that happens with all the elliptic curves we tried. And so we became fascinated by these things. We know no statistics. And when I, uh, I call, I have a friend who um, is a statistician, and I frantically call her every once in a while uh, uh, about some statistical thing, and she will always say, Barry, read a book on statistics. <laughs> 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 so anyway, uh, so I'm reading books on statistics. Anyway, um, okay, uh, whatever, we've become fascinated by these by these um, uh, distributions, which uh, in principle doesn't have anything to do necessarily with um, um, with uh, automorphic forms of uh, you know on GL two or any automorphic. You can always twist by char by Dirichlet characters and see what you get. And there are these statistics, and they seem to depend um, sort of uh, somewhat. In fact. Uh, um, uh, visually, in our computations, they do depend a bit on the elliptic on the elliptic curve, therefore on the automorphic form. So they're they're interesting, and we would love to know, uh, let's say, a closed formula for them. We haven't we haven't found, nor do we have any any guesses. In any case, what this does? Wait, am I? I have two more minutes. What do I have? You can ask. What? You can ask. <laughs> okay. Anyway, here I go. I'm just going to tell you our conjecture that follows, we think, from this and from also a conjecture uh, about the uh, correlations of uh, theta elements of the given theta, of theta coefficients of given theta element. So our conjecture is let E be an elliptic curve over Q. Let M over Q be any abelian uh, field of rational numbers. I would say the interesting thing here would be a, of, in, of, um, of rational numbers. Uh, of, rational, of algebraic numbers. But it has, it contains only finitely many, finitely many subfields of degree two, three, or five. E of M is finitely generated. Um, I should say that this is actually true. This would be true uh, thanks to uh, Cato, Ribet, and Rohrlich 
if uh, M, for example, simply uh, was unramified outside uh, uh, finitely many primes. So, uh, but uh, here we're not assuming that it's unramified outside any many, uh, uh, finitely many primes. Uh, there are many uh, abelian fields uh, that are pretty interesting that are contained in this. And uh, one of the reasons why it might be interesting is that every time you have such a field, uh, such an M, um, where E of M is shown to be finitely generated, uh, Hilbert's tenth problem is false. So this is c connected to uh, sort of recent studies of Hilbert's tenth problem where uh, people don't know about the total, uh, the maximal abelian field they don't know. Is it true or false? So th no, they don't, and the logicians d don't know what to believe there. Which problem is there? What? Which problem is there? Uh, tenth. Uh, uh, that uh, that that um, the ring of integers in um, you know the the ring of integers in uh, uh, in that field would be um, what's called diophantine. That is, say, there's a, an algorithm that determines yes or no. Does an equation with coefficients in that field have a solution in the ring of integers of that field have a solution in the ring of integers of that field? Okay. I think I, am I, I've forgotten. I think this is my, yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll then any questions. Uh, why is symmetric square 2 appears in this Ah, uh, you're right. Why is the, oh, why does the symmetric square? Oh, no, that's a good question. Um, the reason is that, um, I mean, we conjectured this, and we conjectured this without, even before, um, uh, even bef before the data, uh, because if you think of the symmetric square and you think of the uh, Fourier coefficients, there'll be, you know, squares, A, P, A of P squares, and uh, those, uh, those Dirichlet series control the uh, variance of modular symbols. And this is connected to modular symbols. So. Oh, and, uh, and if, if you average such things, not for the theta coefficients, but for the modular symbols, you average it over all modular symbols and ask and uh, normalize appropriately and ask for the appropriate <coughs> variance, the variance will be is proved to be L function of the symmetric square. It's AP square, you have to think of it that way. You, you did not elaborate about the relation with the uh, analytic results, but uh, you mentioned on all each. If you twist by a character of order P and you vary the character, <coughs> yeah. uh, the results of all each, the Mortis, Weisberger, and so on, yeah. they tell you that generically you have no zero, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's so right. So how does it uh, connect with it? It connects perfectly with it, yeah, wow. yeah. But they're, they're always in a specific uh, um, situation where there are only finitely many uh, uh, ramified primes. Yeah. Oh, that's the case? I think that's, yeah, that's I the case. So. so what they prove, they prove this conjecture. If, with a <laughs> forget, this, forget this, they prove this conjecture if M over Q is unramified out fi finitely many primes. Oh, I see. Thank you.